Hello, everyone, and welcome to Friends of the Force, a Star Wars podcast. I'm your host, Brad. And I'm your host, Sarah. And this week on the show, we are having a lovely conversation with senior editor Tom Holler from Random House Worlds, formerly Del Rey. And we're getting to talk about the final anthology in the FACPOV series, aka From a Certain Point of View, this installment being Return of the Jedi. So we are so humbled to be joined by Tom in the studio live today. And by live, I mean we pre-recorded this, (laughs) but it's here live for your ears. (laughs) <laughs> in the zoom room studio um yeah we love tom uh we're big fans we have met a number of times i think both of us uh brad at various conventions over the years and he's always been a friendly face at the Del Rey booth and um we've wanted to have him on the pod for a while because we have some stuff to talk about <laughs> when it comes to star wars books obviously because he has a large uh, part in um ushering those books into the world and and kind of helped shaping them um, in various ways. And so we are so excited that we could have him on for the release of the final, I will say that for his sake, um, <laughs> from a certain point of view, um, Return of the Jedi book, and talk about all the wondrous things that he does as an editor, some of what we love about the anthology, some of what we love about Star Wars books. We talk about a lot of things in this conversation, and we hope that you will join us for this very fun um, journey that we went on. Yeah, and this is a longer one, too. This is this is a longer one. We we got far into the conversation. We were like, oh, my God, it's been an hour or so. We, we're I'm having so some sorry. fun here. But that <laughs> yeah. means that means that you're going to have a good listen here on the show because Tom is just such a wealth of knowledge. Uh, he's been doing this for a really long time. He's done so many different projects across different timelines in Star Wars and, and different types of books, uh, audio dramas, novels, all the stuff. Yeah. And one thing before we dive into this conversation is that I feel like it's kind of difficult to spoil a fact pause, but we do discuss a few of the stories with more detail. So if you want to avoid that, then maybe pause on that one till and and until you read like uh Mike Chen's story or uh Tom Engelberger's story. Cause just because those are a couple that we touch on. But um yeah, we do talk about some story specifics. But that's just the nature of the beast. <laughs> Definitely worth noting. Uh, so I would just sit back and enjoy the conversation ahead. It's a it's a really good one and a, and a great one to, again, celebrate the end of this this anthology trilogy, so to speak. Absolutely. Um, but in the meantime, let's books. <laughs> that's my transition. Let's books. <laughs> I agree, Sarah. Let's books. <laughs> so with that being said, <laughs> let's turn it over to our conversation with senior editor Tom Holler. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Long overdue from the days of handing us arcs at the Del Rey booth to now being here. Hello. Thank you for having me. You know, uh, a long time listener, first time caller. Uh, <laughs> We're so excited to finally have you on the podcast. I'm so sorry for hovering around the booth at multiple conventions. I just really enjoy books. Um, so <laughs> there is a. Uh, so many people apologize for that. And I'm just like, look, I'm stuck there. So I would, I, I so appreciate not being stuck there alone. And I say stuck very affectionately. Um, so no one ever has to apologize for hovering around the booth. Cool. I will work on that. I'll still, I'm still going to do it though. <laughs> so obviously we were here celebrating the release of, from a certain point of view, Return of the Jedi. It's the, the finale of this original trilogy, uh, 40 year anniversary anthology that uh, that you all have been doing. So now that it's out in the world, how's it been just knowing that that body of work is out there for people to read? And you're also concluding this journey that's spanned seven plus years at this point between all three books. I mean, that's, that's pretty wild. Yeah. Um, it feels great. Um, much like with any book that we publish and that I work on until the book is actually on a shelf somewhere and someone can go buy it. It's, there's just this like, it's still not real until that's actually happening. Even when we send it off to the printer, even when I get my copies or the author gets their early copies, like it, to me, it is like still not real until the day that it is actually on sale. Um, and it feels like getting to take a big exhale after holding your breath for a long time. Um, and it's really exciting. And as you said, because it's not just the culmination of this particular book, it's a culmination of, you know, 
a, a three book odyssey. Um, it's um, it's just like it's just remarkable. I I can still remember all of the conversations that we had when there wasn't even a first book, when the first book was still just an idea that we still hadn't really figured out how we were going to do it. And it seemed like a lot, but we were going to figure it out. And because I can still feel all of those things like it's just like I still just have this like, I cannot believe we did this and I can't believe we did this twice. And I really can't believe we did this three times. Um, so it's, it's a lot of that. And then it's just like a lot of gratitude and a lot of feeling so fulfilled about this series that has not just had three entries, but brought itself full circle in a lot of ways. Um, something that, um, I was talking with my colleagues the other day is it's really cool. Cause like the first book, in anything is the first adventure. It's the first time you do a thing. It's when whatever the possibility of the project was gets crystallized and becomes real for the first time. You're like, wow, this really worked. And then when you do the second time, it's building off of that first project, but it also has that pressure of like, well, folks seem to really like when we did it the first time. So if we're going to do it again, like we're going to do it better. Um, and, you know, it takes what the first group of people did and takes the baton and runs it further and faster and bigger and better and all that stuff. But then with the th a third book in a series, and particularly this series, um, this really interesting thing happened that was completely natural. It wasn't a it was not something that I or any of the other folks who worked on the book dictated to any of the contributors. It just happened, which is so many of the people who came to this book to be contributors decided, well, we're not just going to celebrate Return of the Jedi. We're not just going to celebrate the film that the book exists to celebrate. We are also going to celebrate the rest of the series because a bunch of our stories are going to build off those old stories. They're going to be sequels. They're going to tie into them. They're going to build off the characters. They're going to build off the plots. And so in some ways, this third book made itself into a celebration of Fakpov, which is just this beautiful, wonderful thing. So I feel a lot of things about, about the series, but mostly I just feel excited that we did it, that we, we made three books um, and now people get to enjoy them. Not just three books, three books of 40 stories a piece, you know, no, really no small feat. Uh, there's no way to really kind of, I think, quantify <laughs> probably the amount of work that everybody did to participate. So, it's so many stories. It's so <laughs> much, so many, <laughs> so many stories. <laughs> I went, I went looking around just to like find other anthologies that have 40 authors in them. And like, they, they do exist like all across different genres. Um, but there aren't that many of them and there's a reason and many of them are usually um many of them were in our anthologies where it's like there's a bunch of new stuff but also like you know um reprints of works that had previously appeared in other places which in the world of anthology is actually quite common so 40 completely original stories is not very common and i was like oh we didn't really know what we, what we didn't know what we didn't know when we started doing this so we had no idea that that was as um audacious a plan as it ended up being yeah, put it on the top of your resume in all caps, just as, you know, biggest accomplishment here. <laughs> it happened. Um, but I want to take uh, us back just a little bit because some of our listeners uh, may not be super familiar with you or, you know, what you do. So uh, could you give us an introduction to, you know, what your day to day life uh, looks like as a senior editor of Random House Worlds? Sure. Um, so yeah, so I work at um, Penguin Random House and specifically the group there um, for a long time known as Del Rey, which folks are probably um, familiar with if you've read Star Wars books for any amount of time and you probably have books that have the name Del Rey on the bottom of the spine. Um, but very recently, um, the, the name for the team that I'm on switched over to being Random House Worlds, which um, is not really important to get into. You can just think of it as a sports team getting new jerseys. Uh, it's not, it's the same team, same folks, same everything. Um, and I'm a senior editor over there and I work um, on IP, intellectual property or licensed fiction primarily, which is stuff like making books for Star Wars or making books for any sort of big uh, brand or world that has, you know, movies and TV, et cetera. Um, I work on other things other than Star Wars, but Star Wars takes up, um, I think, the majority of my time uh, and is the thing that I spend the most, that I work the most on. Um, and uh, so day to day as a senior editor, my job is to be the fulcrum of, or what I call the fulcrum of the overall process that it takes to get a book from being, you know, a Word document on your computer to being a final finished thing in a bookstore or, you know, on an online retailer that you can go buy and read. Um, and so being an, an editor, um, folks are probably 
familiar with or can probably imagine that it involves reading books and reading stories and working with authors on creative feedback and edits and revisions and all those kinds of things. And that is a part of what I do. In fact, that's what I was doing before I came on the show tonight. Uh, but the larger part of what I do, or at least the thing that I actually do more day to day around all my reading time, is I'm sort of a project manager. Again, as the fulcrum, I'm one of the people whose job it is to like connect all the different part departments that make up a publishing team. So the editorial department and the marketing department, PR department, production, design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I connect all of them. I connect all the different people who will have a hand in working on the book, and I help ferry the book through that process. Um, and the reason why I call the editor the fulcrum is because I am closest to the book within the publishing house. I sort of know the content the best. Um, I know everything about its schedule the best, um, generally have the closest connection with the author and know their story the best. And so any question that might come up about the book or about how best to develop the book, I will either have the answer or I will be a person who will be able to give the expert the information in order to develop the best answer. So that's pretty much what I do from day to day. Um, it's a lot of emails, it's a lot of meetings, it's a lot of telling people, oh, if we're gonna do this, we gotta run over here and tell these people that so that you know, we can coordinate it. It's a lot of doing that. Um, uh, so not as much reading as you might imagine an editor does. It's not like 100% reading on a comfy couch with my cats, um, but there is quite a bit of that, just you know, not, as, not all of it is that. I think that's something not a lot of people would realize an editor uh, would do is like a lot of those project management uh, pieces of it. And I think that's just so fascinating that you kind of wear all these different caps. And then on top of that, you're, you're still very like active on Twitter, like with uh, readers and, and Star Wars fans and doing Q and A's and answering questions about um, projects and giving insights. Um, one of my favorite things that you've, you've done each time one of these have come out is, is give a little insight into every story as they're announced, you know, giving a quote tweet about this one's my favorite, this one's the longest, you know, and I think that that really helps to go a long way um, for you to, uh, to finally like bring this thing through to the finish line, but also get a lot of people excited about it. And I'm sure you as a longtime Star Wars fan have, have that excitement deep down as well as, as like on top of the professionalism that you have to man maintain. And like, I would love to know where your first introduction to star Wars was and like what impact it had on you to now be in a position where you get to edit a lot of these projects. Sure. Um, unfortunately though, this is a question I've been asked a bunch of times. I actually don't have the answer to like what my first exposure to star Wars is. I don't remember. I don't know. And no one around me who would know, like my, my mom or, you know, any of my immediate relatives, none of them know. Nobody has the answer to like when I first saw Star Wars or like what was my first um, interaction with it. Um, as best as anyone could guess and as best that I can deduce, it is definitely um, the it is definitely the original trilogy. Um, I'm a, you know, a, a born in the late 80s, so grew up primarily, you know, grew up in the 90s. Um, so it was definitely the original trilogy. And I know that while my first experience seeing Star Wars, like in a theater, was going to see the special editions when they were released, I know that I had seen it a bunch of times and it was like already deep into loving Star Wars by the time those came out. So it was probably, you know, a VHS at some point, but I can't remember, which um, at one point is like, I guess a little sad because I always hear these like amazing stories of people talking about the first time they saw it and who they were with and the, you know, the the bond that it created between friends or deeper bonds between family because they shared this thing together for the first time. And I don't have that. But then that just means that I get to say like, well, you know, Star Wars just always been with me <laughs> since I can't remember. I was born already knowing what Star Wars was. Um, but even if I can't remember like the exact first experience, I remember um, wearing out the VHS tapes in my house um, with my siblings and just like having Star Wars on a lot, um, you know, at a time when your access to media was literally pretty much just um, restricted to what did you have in your house. And though I grew up in a house where we had lots of movies and things, you know, uh, Star Wars was was always there at the fore. Um, and I remember in particular watching Return of the Jedi about a billion times because at one point we moved and we just lost the other two movies. And I don't know why, like I never maybe asked for Christmas or my birthday, like, hey, could, can we get new copies? We just didn't. So the only one I had in my house was to return of the Jedi. So just watch <laughs> that over and over again. Um, as for kind of how it, it got me here and, and the impact that it had, I mean, it was profound. It, it had um, 
the kind of it, it instilled that sense of of wonder and possibility of not just creating a story but creating a world where like infinite stories can happen and and layering in you know themes about the world around you into this this fake place that you can tell stories that actually you know that reflect reality or reflect uh, uh, something that you hope for the real world um and it it like was it was profoundly impactful. Um, very shortly after that, I started reading Star Wars books. Um, and for a really long time, though there were you know plenty of people that I talked about with Star Wars, for the most part, Star Wars was just kind of my thing. I like did not engage in like fandoms that much, at least as an active participant when I was younger. And even like as I grew up and the internet and, and online fandoms became more um, ubiquitous, I was sort of like kind of a watcher, but not really an active participant. And talking about Star Wars and particularly like Star Wars books was a thing that was like just mine. I just would read them myself and I would get each one. And every once in a while, if my friends and I were talking about Star Wars, I might mention something from a book that I knew because like they were being like, I wonder who, you know, what happened to this? And I'd, I'd share, but I didn't have like groups of people that I engaged with. It was very much mine. And so it, in some way, not that I feel like a sense of ownership over it, over other people, but in some way that like deepened my individual connection to star wars and i think that is partly what fueled my desire to be like well somebody makes these books and i would like to make books so why can't i help be one of the people who make star wars books like it was kind of as simple as that when i was making a calculus in my head about um be moving into publishing and becoming an editor and thinking about well what do i want to edit you know that's kind of the first question you have to ask yourself if you want to go into publishing is like well what do i want to publish um and so i think all of that is like how it it brought me there um, and how it got me to this point. And interestingly enough, Brad, you were mentioning about like, you know, active on social media, giving behind the scenes insights into Star Wars and stuff. And that actually came because one of the things when I was quote unquote, a, a, an observer of like Star Wars books and fandom, but not really a participant is like remembering editors of days, your like posting on forums or at panels, like giving these behind the scenes insights and feeling this amazing sense of like getting to peek behind the curtain to a thing that I now suddenly wanted to do. Um, and so when I started the, when I started, when I got this job and started, um, I wanted to carry that forward in whatever way that it could. And also because when I first started, not only was I an editor or an editorial assistant, but I also was managing the social media for a long time. So my continued participation uh, in social media with those things that you mentioned is actually more or less just an offshoot from the number of years when I was also doing all of the, the social media stuff. Yes. Uh, I, I probably taking, you know, like the Delray Star Wars, um, portion of your job was maybe a little bit like a stress reliever do say thank you for the the tom delray star wars <laughs> days those were fun times um with uh fun giveaways and such things so i don't know um, where i had the time for that i think about that and i'm like how did i do all of that stuff and i did like and it was like it made sense at the time like i honestly never questioned it until i stopped doing it and i was like how did i have time for this and all the other stuff but uh it was a blast yeah, it's like you make it happen while while it's all on your plate and you're like, yeah, I can manage all these things. I've I've had a couple of transitions like that and you're like, um, I lived. <laughs> How? <laughs> but great, I'll take it. Um, you know, kind of bringing us back to these books in particular, um and not just the Return of the Jedi book, but the the three that have been completed. You know, what are some of the most rewarding and challenging parts of these anthologies in particular across, you know, all, all different kinds of books that you uh, participate in. Sure. So the the challenging part first that we've sort of joked about, but is very true, is just the breadth of work involved in making one of them is is a lot because you are making a short story. You're making a Star Wars short story. You might say, well, it's a short story. It's you know, it's not like a hundred thousand word novels or short stories. So how much work could that be? But it's a lot because even whether we're making a, a story that's 2000 words long or a hundred thousand words long, it's the same level of intentionality and ideally detail and rigor, you know, regardless of the word count. And so you're doing that. You're doing that 40 times with 40 different people who all have different writing styles, different ways of wanting to be edited or, or different ways that you have to engage or communicate and interact with them because they're different people. And oh, by the way, you have to do those 40 things with those 40 different people all at the same time, 
all at once, you know, uh, faster and more intense times. 40. <laughs> right. um, and so the, the challenge really is the scope of it because the mm -hmm. scope of it is just is it, it is just intense. And that brings with it all bunch of other challenges on the like logistical side about like, how do you produce this book all at once? Because each of the 40 stories is done at a different time, but the book all has to be ready at a certain time because things have to be, you know, you have to move from word documents to layouts at some point and things have to be edited and you have to get feedback and approvals. And we've got to go through outline phases and manuscript phases, and we've got to find the contributors. And again, it's all these things times for every single time I say one of those elements, it's like, yep, that times 40, that times 40. Um, so the challenge is really the scope. Um, and luckily, though, you know, it's like this is not just like me in a closet somewhere. Um, I'm just one member of a very large team uh, of people who are all rowing, running, pushing, pulling, carrying each other in the same direction to get this done. Um, and so um, those are the challenges. Um, and it's also kind of, as I mentioned a little bit at the beginning, the challenge of like when you when we do something that people really like. It's like each time you want it to feel worthy of those people. Like the first time you like some cool for doing it the second time, it's got to feel worthy of the readers the second time. And then the third time, this can't just feel like, oh, well, yeah, they got to round out the trilogy. Of course, you can't just do two of the three original films, right? The third one has to earn that as well. And um, I know that I felt that um, uh, not like pressure, but I felt that responsibility. I didn't know the contributors did. And I know that the rest of the team did is like feeling that responsibility of not wanting someone to come away from particularly the third book and be like, yeah, I guess they just had to make the third one. You can definitely tell, you know, like that sort of thing, wanting, wanting to keep that, keep that up. So those are all the challenges, but you were asking, and the better part obviously is like, what's the reward? What's rewarding? Um, the thing that's rewarding about this which is the same thing about, which is the same thing that's rewarding about every book that I get to work on, that I have the privilege of working on, is that I get to work with these amazing creators, these amazing authors, these amazing contributors who are so many of them coming to Star Wars for the first time as a professional, as a writer, you know, as, as someone who's, who's coming to actually write a Star Wars story and getting to go through that process of helping them find their Star Wars story. Not the Star Wars story that anybody could write or not the Star Wars story that's been written 50 times before. The Star Wars story that only they could write because they are a, you know, luminous, unique individual with a, you know, unique voice and experience, perspective and connection to Star Wars all their own and getting to help them make that story real. And then at the end of that process, hand them a finished book and say, here you go, your name's on a Star War. And getting to do that 40 times like that's it's so incredible it's so incredible it never gets old and so getting to do that 40 times in a row like in a short amount of time is just like distilled joy um and that's the best part of it um that and then the second part is the joy that uh, people seem to have about this series the joy of like when the characters get announced or when the the little story excerpts go out and people realize like how are they going to tell a story about this character oh my gosh you know like that the just general joy that seems to be uh kind of stitched into the pages of this series that's the most rewarding thing. um those those two things are the most rewarding things i think there's probably there's a lot more but i think those two are like they sit top of mind to me I think what's so exciting about like this series in particular is something similar to why, at least for me, I get really excited about visions because it's like, oh, we can do anything. We can go anywhere uh, and, and kind of explore stories in totally different ways. So as you were just talking about like, the, oh, we did that. I was thinking about, um, I believe it's Delilah's story, Delilah Dawson's story in uh, the Empire Strikes Back anthology. It's like, where, where did that come from? It's brilliant, you know? Um, so yeah, it, that's always a, a fun thing. Um, but kind of, I, I, you mentioned the biggest challenge is the logistics and putting uh, a book together times 40 people writing said book. You know, what are the sum of the key things that you would do to stay organized and facilitate, you know, the book um, in a way that everybody is proud of and can ultimately enjoy when it's out on the shelves? Um. Yeah, the short answer to that is uh, spreadsheets. Uh, Microsoft Excel is our best friend when it comes to this particular project um, and multiple spreadsheets and multiple spreadsheets on top of spreadsheets. Um, it's, you know, because being an editor is largely an exercise and being a project manager, 
the the key skill that like anyone who ever asks me about getting into publishing that I talk about before I ever talk about like your ability to be a critical reader or anything is like how organized are you? Uh, how good's your organization? Because that is you know that is the the most important thing. And so for this particular series, we put together like a series of kind of like rules and procedures that we follow to keep this thing organized um that have everything to do with like excel grids we build to track everything from who have we contacted who said yes what's outstanding where's this paperwork kind of stuff like that sort of stuff all the way through to like characters that have been chosen characters that haven't what's the status of different character choices what is the order going to look like and we've gotten definitely better over the course of every book the first book was so much a learning experience and then the second book we got a little better and for this one we got much better as far as like those efficiencies um but it also comes down to really understanding like before we do anything else actually sitting down and breaking down whichever film we happen to be celebrating and understanding each film as much as we can not because like we need to be like oh which characters might we have because that is as I think we're gonna talk about, that's like an author driven thing for the most part, but understanding like how is each film organized? How does the narrative flow? What's the pacing of each film in order to be like, in order to know where are the challenge points? Because are we gonna end up with a film where we get 40 Ewok stories? We can't have 40 Ewok stories, you know? As much as Oops All Ewoks edition would be really cool, you know, we've gotta have, we wanna celebrate the whole film. And are there parts of the film that are gonna be more challenging than others to try to find stories for that are gonna be more bloated than others? Um, and so starting with this survey of the movie, which is just a fun way of saying, I got to watch Star Wars movies a whole lot and say that I was working. Um, <laughs> and breaking down each film as far as its scenes and uh, the possible characters and stuff, that was probably the biggest, like the biggest best first thing that we could do to put us in the right, put us on the right foot to like doing this correctly. Um, and then, you know, over time, we also just got better about like, oh, we actually need X amount of time to do this part of this project. So when we get to book two and book three, let's build this much time in and let's do these things in this order instead. Um, there's a lot of those like little efficiencies, which again, you only learn doing it three times. Cause the first time we did this, we were really just like, we know this is a bad idea. We know this is so much work, <laughs> but we kind of said it. So now we have to do it because it's, like you put that mountain in front of yourself and then you're just like, well, now I got to climb that thing because it's there and I put it there. Uh, you know, that was like the, and then, then you don't think about it. But then each other time we would look back and be like, yeah, we, let's not do what we did there again. You know, let's, let's be a little more organized or let's change this thing. Um, uh, yeah. Um, and then because I'm, you know, because we talked about, like, there's a whole team involved with this. So it's all just about, like, always communicating with everyone and always having everyone facilitate that improvement. So saying to people, like, hey, who's got ideas on how we can do this better next time? Who's got ideas on how we can fix this challenge we ran into or how we can make something easier from every, like, and we had input from marketing and PR folks, production folks, people in design, all the different editorial folks, like everybody had a hand in not just making this, but also making this thing better each time. Um, that was like, that was really important because if you're going to have a big team and if you're gonna have a big, awesome team, like you have to leverage that big, awesome team at every stage, right? Yeah, you sort of addressed one of our one of our other questions that we we had wondered was, you know, you learn something each time with one of these. And I think that sort of stacks itself where you're like, by, by the time you get to the third book, you have two of these under your belt, you know what works and what doesn't. But from a character perspective and like selecting those points of view, do you feel like each installment, the the floodgates kind of kept opening wider and wider? Because like, you know, you have the first book and then the second book, you're like, let's get weird. Let's do the force cave, you know? And then now the third book, it's like, you have Jabba's palace, you have the Ewok village, you have like an entire fleet of rebels. Like, do you feel like it kind of boiled up to a point where, um, return of the Jedi was kind of the quote unquote weirdest you could get, um, to go out with a bang. Uh, it's definitely not the weirdest you could get because Star Wars can always get weirder. Um, True. I love, when, I love <laughs> when Star Wars gets weird. Um, I, I think that's that's cool when Star Wars gets weird. Um, Chapter 18 of Shadowfall, that's all I I'll say. I was about to say that. I'm glad we were on the same page. Yes. <laughs> still still traumatized. Anyways. Uh, if, you, if anyone hasn't read it, just go find a copy of Shadowfall, open to Chapter 18 to read it. Go for it. Just dive right in. Go for it. Just go right into the deep end. Um, uh, 
but yes and no and and i'll explain what i mean by that so um the floodgates definitely opened as far as the um i think the word that i've used a lot for it is like the audacity of the storytelling across all three and that really comes from all of the contributors and i think in particular um, we owe uh, a real debt to the first group of contributors because, you know, we have this idea that we bring to all of them. We're like, hey, we're doing 40 stories, celebrate Star Wars, we're going to retell the first film, but you can't use any of the main characters. You just, all the background and the side characters, and we want to retell the plot of the movie through their eyes. And that's like a, you know, it's a solid idea. It's got a, you know, a pretty clear message to it. But until we got those story pitches, until people start saying, okay, I want to do this character, until Jason Fry's like, I want to do fake wedge antilles not wedge until i want to do fake wedge antilles right you know until um those story choices come in and then those manuscripts come in that's the moment where i know that the entire team looked at each other and we were like oh my gosh because there's a version of fact that is just like super straightforward down the line and, and every story is literally just like you know, this character is watching Han walk over to talk to Greedo kind of thing. Like every, you know, there's a very straightforward version of a lot of these stories, but all of the authors from that first anthology, everybody just took that idea and they ran with it. And in doing so, it created this model that when we got to The Empire Strikes Back, you know, I haven't talked to her about this, but I have to imagine that Tracy Dion, who wrote the story about the cave, which we had the same reaction you did <laughs> as far as when that first idea came in, like, you're going to write about the cave? Okay. <laughs> like, this is ridiculous. I, we never would have thought of this, which yeah. is why, why we have you, dear wonderful authors. Um, but I think they all looked at that first entry and they were like, you can do that, you know, looking at this story or that story. Oh my gosh, that is possible. And saying, cool. I'll take that bet and let's get weirder. You know, like, let's take that next step. And then I think the contributors for the third one looked at the first two and they were like, oh my gosh, you can write a story about the space slug across millions of years. And you can write the story that's a, a Imperial trying to get Darth Vader in trouble with HR. And like, you can do all these things. Oh my gosh. And that is, I think each entry gave the next entry almost permission to be more audacious because every group of authors modeled for the next, like what was possible. And then every subsequent group said, awesome. I want to take this further. I want to push this further. And it also taught us on the editorial team because with each successive entry, we were able to look at these, the really wild and weird and outlandish ideas and say, yeah, we, we know we can make this work because it actually has worked for you. You don't have to be worried about that. You know, don't be scared. Like, you know, we can, we can figure this out. Um, because those other authors and those other stories had taught that to us. Um, yeah, but yeah, it definitely, you know, um, I think we have, I think a lot of the weird has crescendoed in uh, Richard and Jedi, but I have no doubt that a group of authors could figure out how to get weirder, or how to get more audacious. Um, I never underestimate authors. All right. This is the 2050s are calling. I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I, speaking of the contributors and and um every time i look at one of these book covers i'm like holy cow they can barely fit all the names of these excellent authors and they're all sitting right next to each other on the cover on the cover what is it like coming up with and recruiting such excellent lists of authors for each book and seeing many new voices, but also seeing some voices return book after book um, and kind of, you know, balancing the, the, uh, the roster of authors that you have each time. It's so much fun putting together the list of contributors um, because it, it really starts with, we get everybody who's involved with the book and fellow editors, friends at Lucasfilm, every, we all sit down and we just kind of make this big dream list of like, people we've always wanted to work with authors you know people in entertainment and pop culture journalists like we just all sit around and we say who do we love who do we love reading like who who matters to each of us who are you know literary heroes and people we admire and folks that you know we haven't worked with in forever that we are dying to work with again or people we've just discovered and we're like oh my gosh i have to know what their star wars story is and we sit down we just make this big list and we really like go through and talk about what excites us um and it's this dream thing, you know, you get to work with people. I have gotten to work with people across this series that like, I never could have ever imagined that I would get to work with as an editor. And it's, that's amazing. And so that, that informs some of it. 
Um, but to your point, it was always important for us and it remained important throughout the series. In fact, it actually, I guess, became more important as the series went along that we, we saw this as a vehicle and an avenue to bring more people into the Star Wars tent, bring more voices into Star Wars, bring folks who had never written for Star Wars before in because something that we all know intrinsically is that like every time you bring a new voice into Star Wars, every time you bring a new perspective, Star Wars gets better gets cooler it gets weirder but it gets better and it moves forward and that's one of the ways that it endures for 40 years and now we're coming up on almost 50 years and so that felt like a natural way to celebrate star wars's legacy and impact was to bring new voices into it and show the possibility space of what they could do um and also then ideally that then some of them would go on many of them ideally going on to do even more in star wars you know write full novels write comic series participate in you know big initiatives like the high republic write audio originals um and the cool thing is like all that stuff has actually already happened and i you know and i imagine and hope that it will continue into the future so there's this real um sense of wanting to celebrate star wars's past celebrate its present but also celebrate its future through our contributor lists um and um, that was that played a big part in figuring out which authors to um, bring on, um, played a part in which authors returned from book to book, um, played a big part in, in a lot of those choices. And, and also there's just the practical thing of like with any project, you know, um, you might need five people. You should definitely have a list more than five people long because somebody's going to say no for some reason. You know, somebody's not going to be able to do it or 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 whatever. So. Um, but then, yeah, it was it was mostly those two things that really guided um, the the author choices, um, and some of it to go back to what we we're talking about about never um, never apologize for hanging around the booth. Some of it absolutely came from like over the years just talking to readers about like, hey, what authors do you like? Like, just who do you read when you're not reading Star Wars? Like, who do you who do you find cool? Because you know, my job as an editor is to always be looking around for voices and new voices, and always be trying to learn more about voices in publishing in you know fiction in science fiction and fantasy and so i use readers and i use fans and i use other people as resources all the time because as much as i try to keep up with that stuff and try to read things like you know i've got i've got projects to manage i've got manuscripts to read. i got so much to do that um I, we use that research to find people to dig into and to research and to you know eventually invite to come play come play in the sandbox with us that's why star wars publishing and i think i can probably speak for for sarah as well on this is like our favorite because i think the the sandbox is so open whereas we might only get a couple maybe like one or two shows a year for as long as i can remember at this point because i am i am so deep in the in the kool-aid bowl that i can't i can't escape um it's just book after book after book for years. And that's so exciting when there's just an array of people and, and voices. And you mentioned like new authors coming in to uh, write full length projects after that. I mean, just a couple off the top of my head, Mike Chen went on to write Brotherhood, uh, Kirsten White, Padawan, and then Lydia Kang, not only to write another Star Wars book, but be within the High Republic, which is a, a huge honor to, to join that crew. And so it's really exciting to see Every time those lists were released, it's like, who's going to write the next Star Wars book? Is there is going to be somebody on this list? Um, and that's always so cool to think that this was sort of an, maybe an entry point for some of those authors to uh, find their Star Wars voice uh, and then get to build on that into the future. And I'm sure there's like a lot of pride that you feel like, you know, getting to work with some of those authors, not only once, but twice. Um, and, you know, within different styles of writing and, and different uh, eras, perhaps as well. Yeah, it's great, you know, and, and the thing about being an editor is whether you're working with an author on a 2000 word short story or a full novel or a trilogy or a, you know, you know, multi book connected initiative. Your job as an editor is really um, or core to your job as an editor is the relationship that you develop with the author. You have to develop a relationship that is like that has trust because you are working together on storytelling and you have to give each other feedback and you have to critique each other. And so there has to be a level of trust about like the way in which critique and criticism and, you know, this needs to be improved is going to be delivered. And also you spend a lot of time with each other and you're talking to each other all the time. So you develop relationships with people 
like you just do even if you didn't want to you're going to just by the the osmosis and the amount of work involved and so being able to work with folks again it's not just exciting on a professional level of getting to see them blossom and spread into new storytells, new stories or new writing styles, or, oh my gosh, what you did with this character is great. I cannot wait to see what you do with this other character. But it's also like for, you know, I, it's getting to hang out with friends again. It's getting to reconnect with people that, you know, uh, uh, I'm close with and, or that I've developed relationship with. And so, yeah, it's really meaningful when something that was a shorter term collaboration that later you get to go back to it and say, "Hey, let's let's work on a full book together." That's that's uh, it's super fulfilling. Um, it's super super fulfilling because that's the best part of being an editor is getting to work with people on stories, um, and especially when you get to do it, you know, more than once, and you get to develop a history with someone uh, over time. Speaking of authors that you've gotten to work with a couple of times, uh, specific to these anthologies, uh, and this one in particular was very fun. I think was uh, Tom Engelberger who has written each of the Will's stories at the end of Fakpov. Uh, and this one, this one especially was very fun with allusions to, hey, are we going to go back 30 years? Are we going to go talk about taxation of trade routes? Like, which is probably the question on, on so many fans' minds, uh, as we all jokingly say, I will be there in 2047 for The Last Jedi Fakpov. <laughs> like, Brad, you just got to make it to 2047, just in case. Just in case. <laughs> but in all seriousness, like, why do you feel, uh, Tom Engelberger was the right choice for that type of story. And like, why do you think a story that does shatter the fourth wall in Star Wars in that way uh, was the perfect conclusion that each of these books needed? And especially this one in particular, uh, being the end of a trilogy of books. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a couple of pieces to that, but we can start with um, why Tom Engelberger was the right author for this. If anyone's not familiar with Tom's work. Um, he's got a, a very popular series called Origami Yoda, but he also wrote um, a novelization, a kind of new novelization of um, Return of the Jedi um, a number of years ago called Star Wars Return of the Jedi Beware the Power of the Dark Side. And there were three such novelizations. Um, really great. Um, folks should should check them all out. Uh, Alex Bracken wrote the first one, the, um, the Princess, the Scoundrel, and the Farm Boy about A New Hope. And then the second one was, uh, oh my God, I can't believe I can't remember this. Um, Adam Gowitz wrote, um, like, so, uh, so You Want to Be a Jedi, which was The Empire Strikes Back. These are really great anthologies. You should check them out. In fact, um, apologies for the sidetrack here, but the Alex Bracken store, or the Alex Bracken anthology, originally, Fakpov was going to just be one author retelling A New Hope across across the idea of all these side characters. And we were just gonna have one author do it. And one of the reasons that we reconsidered that, which then ultimately led to the crazy idea of 40 authors, 40 stories, was that we actually like, Alex Bracken kind of already did that and it's amazing. I mean, that book is mostly from the POV of the main characters, but that she did such an amazing job with that book that we were sort of like, uh, let's, uh, wh why do we have to, why, why duplicate that? that? That was already great. But anyway, um, back to Tom. So Tom wrote that. And if you read that novelization, it has this sort of fourth wall breaking narrative voice to it. The, the scene where, you know, Lando is piloting the Millennium Falcon out of the Death Star. There's this whole thing of like, oh my gosh, is he going to make it is like literally written in the book as like, it's almost as if the narrator of that novelization is watching Star Wars. And so because of that, he just had a voice and a style that seemed to fit with this wonky idea of, well, you know, there's always been this long idea in Star Wars of the wills and like, what's going on with the crawls and like, who's writing these and like this kind of who's writing Star Wars thing. Um, and so he was the perfect person for this ridiculous um, idea. And it also made, made sense to have each book end with this kind of story as this recap of the whole film and this celebration and ode to the storytelling process because each story is about somebody trying to write out effectively the story of star wars and somebody uh you know kool-aid manning their way into the room to uh give them uh perhaps unwanted uh editorial <laughs> feedback so it sort of was this nice capper now as for the third one uh you know, it wasn't so much um, shattering the fourth wall to like nod towards like, are there going to be more of these books? It was actually bringing Tom's stories full circle because in the first one, when the, you know, the, the editor Will walks in on the, the Will who is writing and is like, cool. All right, cool. Doing this Star Wars thing. Great. So like, 
let me see where you're starting. Wait a minute. Why are you starting with the rebellion of the empire? What about the clone wars? And they have this whole argument about like, you're just going to skip all that. Oh my God, you're going to skip Darth Maul. Um, and so, you know, Tom and I thought that it would be fun to bring that actual narrative full circle of being able to be like, Hey, maybe we'll actually go talk about Darth Maul now, because I know you're still upset about the fact that we, we skipped Darth Maul and we skipped Jin or so, and we skipped all this stuff. Um, so it was a more nod to that though. I, I certainly can see how, how readers might look at that and be like, maybe, um, but, uh, it was fun to be able to bring that full circle and kind of celebrate those three stories as, kind of emblematic of the series as the whole they those three stories are almost the avatar for the fact pop series within the book and so that it just knew from the very beginning like that's going to be the last story it's going to follow the crawl we're going to have some fun with the fact that um you know the will from the first one is still annoyed about how it all started so now he this time they're gonna have this little mea culpa and like all right you can help me with the next <laughs> one. Um, and it's but that like was really a, great. you call up tom engelberg and be like you're coming back again. You don't have a choice. In the <laughs> yeah. Basically each time I went back to Tom after the first one, which he was so excited to participate in the first one. And this idea was so thrilling to him that it was the easiest thing in the world to send him a note and be like, Hey, we're going to do a second one. Do you want to, you want to do this again? He, you know, and then again, to send him a, Hey, do you want to, you, you, you want to finish, finish out the trilogy? It's the easiest emails I've ever written in my life. Um, uh, and he was, you know, such a joy. Um, so yeah. Yeah, one one down, thirty nine more emails to go. At least, you know. <laughs> Pretty much, um, I'm pre actually. I I do think that on book two and book three, he probably was the first person that I sent an email to because we just we're not. It's like, can we have a fact pub without a will story? Maybe, but I don't see why we would ever need to try to find out. <laughs> um, you know, I always am so delighted like finishing the book on such a lighthearted and fun note um, because you know. I obviously enjoyed these stories, but I'm a huge, huge fan of uh, the mighty Chewbacca in the forest of fear, um, which is another middle grade by him. Um, and this is my, my shameless plug to the listener. If I don't care how old you are, if you haven't read or listened to perhaps listen, li the audiobook is really fun. Um, there's a lot of Chewbacca roaring, um, but uh, it is so funny and it's so fast paced and it also like bridges the rogue one kind of gap a little bit with k2s so guys it's a really good one so i just have to it's phenomenal thank you for remembering anytime that. i can yeah no, it's, it's it's literally up on like on my bookshelf and like these are my very favorite star wars books <laughs> the mighty chewbacca in the forest of fear the people need to know um so that's not a question that's just me getting excited about books um is there you know, a, a POV in this story that you were most excited for or anticipating to be announced to, you know, readers. And um, this is a second question that's tangential, but definitely not the same as the first. Is there one that you were most surprised by in terms of an author making a choice? We've been talking about kind of the audacity and and um, people make, making really bold kind of uh, choices in what they were going to tell. Is there one that you were specifically surprised by? Um, so let's start with, um, okay. So as far as surprise, um, I'm actually going to say, I'm actually surprised that we did not end up with as many Ewok POV stories. I actually did think we were going to have the oops, all Ewoks edition and that we were going to have to have some sort of like, you know, we were going to have like 40 authors who wanted to write Ewok stories. We're going to have to have some sort of like decathlon to figure out who actually gets to write them, you know, like, um, but that actually didn't happen, which was interesting. I as far as like surprise and audacity and i'm i'm looking at i you would think that i know all these stories by heart but um it I'm all looking blurs together at, at this point i'm sure yeah, i'm looking at the table of contents <laughs> here to buy myself some time uh well i'm not surprised at the character choice but i was certainly surprised by um the the author's confidence and their desire to want to do this story, which was Alex Jennings and Obi-Wan Kenobi, the story that is called from a certain point of view. And why I was surprised by that is not because I had any doubt that Alex Jennings, who was a brilliant writer, could do it, but it's the titular story of the series. It's the line of dialogue for which this entire series exists from. And I knew that I'm like, that we have to get that story right. That story, whatever story, because we always knew, like, there's going to be a story. That's that's it has to be. Um, 
And I was like, we and we have to get that one right because otherwise, again, that would just be so weird for the story that is emblematic, as titular to the whole series, didn't work. And so that Alex was so quickly and just like, no, I want that story, I got it, and I know how to do it, was surprising to me in the comments, but again, not because of his talents. And he did absolutely nail it. Um, I would say the one that really probably did surprise me so much was K. Arsenal Rivera's story, Kickback, about the. Um, gangster um you know mercenary who is working for jabba who um gets kicked in the face by luke skywalker and um <laughs> when uh Kay sent in that just like i want to do the guy gets kicked by luke skywalker by you know in the chanel boots i was like i just i was just cracking up and because it was so funny and i just you know with all of these i always imagine like okay it's probably likely we'll get a story about this character oh yeah that character would that would make sense it just never occurred to me that anyone would choose that particular character. So that one probably surprised me the most. As far as excited to reveal, um, one, and I think it bore out in a lot of the reaction to the reveals, Adam Lance Garcia, Dexter Jetster. Um, one, because I just knew one part of the reaction was going to be like, wait a minute, how? because you know he's a prequel character like what, what where he's not in this movie like where is he um and then also because i just i had read that story a bunch of times and you know worked on on it with adam and and it was just like i knew what that story i knew how that story was going to hit for people and i knew how that was going to land for people um and i knew that that what that story was going to do for that character um and so that one for sure um uh and Emma Mieko Candon writing Wedge Antilles, just because, you know, Emma had written Ronin, which is a store, is a book and a story that hits like a truck in no small part because of Emma's absolutely singular voice on the page. And so then to be able to share with people like that author is picking up the the baton of Wedge Antilles, probably the prototypical Fakpov and just like Star Wars publishing character. Um, that was super exciting to me. Um, uh, and just so many, because I think so many of the choices around stories in this one, in part because so many of them connect back to earlier fact pods, I was just so excited for people to find out about all of them, to find out that like Fran Wilde is doing a Mon Mothma story. And not only that, but guess what? Fran Wilde has read Alexander Freed's fact pod story. And Fran Wilde is like, that one's titled No Contingency. This one's going to be titled The Last Contingency because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're bringing it all back. And so many of the authors were doing that in very big and very small ways. And so it is hard to pick. It's hard not to just name all of them. But uh, so we'll, we'll say those three. Um, but yeah, it was, it was super exciting. Um, and also because you know, the, the first time this project came around, obviously nobody knew what it was. Nobody knew we were doing it. We teased everyone. We we're like, we're doing this thing called Operation Blue Milk. And people are like, what is that? Um, and then after we did it the first time, you know, plenty of folks were asking, are you going to do a second one? But there wasn't a lot of certainty that we would do a second one. You know, people I think were hopeful. But I think once we did the second one, even though we did not announce the third entry until early this year, um, I think everybody, it was like the worst kept secret in, in book public, in Star Wars. Oh, public, totally. Right? It was the worst yeah. kept secret that like, well, they did too. They're not, not going to do the third one. And so that is why too, it was just because there was so much anticipation. People, I, in fact, I, I, I'm pretty sure I heard it at least once on this show. People would just be like, yeah, I wonder what Star Wars stories we're going to get next year in 2023. And people would be like, well, we're definitely getting Fact Pop 3. Right. And then they would go on to their theorizing about like, I hope we get a story about X or I would love to see why. So many people were just like, had penciled it in. In fact, they'd written it in in permanent marker, not even pencil. So to get around to just announcing the thing itself, to confirm that worst kept secret was in its own right, um, just so exciting. And I, I could not wait to do it. I was like, when can we do this? And then um, to just give people like a little bit of insight into like, yeah, when, how, how, how do these books get announced? A lot of it has to do with like, first of all, you know, you don't want to announce 10 books on top of each other. So when a book's getting announced by us or by our friends at Lucasfilm or, you know, the Marvel folks are announcing you a comic, you know, you don't want to pile all the books on top of each other um, and all the stories. You want to give things space. You want to be able to give things their moment, um, you know, and if you're going to announce things together, that's usually, you know, when you see things at like a celebration panel or Comic-Con panel. Um, so there's that. And then there's also just considerations around 
my team and everyone, we're always like, we want to announce a project when we know that it's ready and we know that like we can share as much about it as we can and that we can really make a big deal about it and give readers a real sense of what it is. And also announce it within an amount of time of its release that like you don't announce something and then like three years later you're like, hey, remember this thing we announced? It's like you almost have to re-announce it if you do that too far. And so there's a lot of considerations that go into it, but I was absolutely chomping at the bit to get Return of the Jedi announced. Um, um, but I'm also glad that we waited because that meant that the cover, Will Staley, who's done all three covers, his cover for Return of the Jedi was done and that cover just like floored me. Oh my gosh. Like and so, yeah, it's yeah. so beautiful. It's, it's gorgeous. I, so I look at it good. at least 40 times a day. Speaking of doing things times 40. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 40 uh, times. Will, Will's work across this series um, on all three of them is phenomenal. Um, and and the books just like wouldn't be what they are without his his work on those three covers. Um, we even have a couple of um, like draft outtakes of other versions of covers that we never went with. And like even those would have been phenomenal. <laughs> it was like literally no bad ideas. <laughs> there were no bad choices, no bad drafts. Um, he's he's incredible. Yeah, I'm I'm obsessed with all of them. They look beautiful on my shelves. And they're also just I'm not a dust jacket reader. I take the dust jacket off before I read. I think people I can't. Who reads a dust jacket on? Not me. We're keeping her safe. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I'm reading and I have it next are to you, me, it's always Are you nice. okay with the fact that um, Return of the Jedi is blue underneath its dust jacket and the other two are black? Does that ooh, bother you? I mean, does it, does it, ooh, does it bother me? Well, they're all sitting on my shelf with the dust jackets on them. So I'm not thinking about it super actively. Um, but why? why? Um, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, <laughs> so, uh, if for, for for people who are wondering, you know, under the dust jacket of a hardcover book, if you take the dust jacket off, you know, you'll see the physical book itself. We call it. It's called the case. I know, super super technical term there. The case. Um, and the case of the book, um, who decides what color of the case is going to be could vary by publisher and team and whatever. There's no like general rule. And so with our team, though, usually we, I, we leave that up to our production team. And our production and design team usually choose a case color that complements the jacket in some way. So for instance, if you've got a jacket that has like white going all the way to the edges on the jacket, you know, like Light of the Jedi is a good example. You know, you don't want the case of the book to be black because like you'll kind of look at the book at an angle and there'll just, just be this black or any other color weird thing kind of breaking up that white of the edge of the jacket. So that's why a case will be a certain color. You know, Shadow of the Sith has a has a red case, you know, because most of that cover is red and it just helps um, round out the overall profile and look of the book. And so they chose blue for this one because of the way that those blue hues and the colors play on the jacket. And since the other two jackets were really leveraging like silver and gold with all the black, it just worked to do um, to do those in black. Um, but we usually leave that up to the design team and they always pick a really awesome color. Um, and what's really cool is I usually don't know what the color is until um, I get my sample copy. So I get to have the same fun that every reader does, which is take the jacket off and look underneath and see what color it is. It's always um, fun to, for me to discover also like what the, the um, spine stamp colors. Yes, the in. spine. Yeah. Same thing. Same thing. Um, uh, yeah, it's that. That is a really fun part of the process. That I um, every once in a while I will ask in advance, just because I get curious. But usually I don't. Usually I just wait um, because they always make the right choice. Um, um, actually, I will tell you all a weird, fun publishing fact, which is um, anyone who has a copy of Heir to the Empire the original Timothy Zahn, you know, uh, novel from 1991. Go look at it if you got a hardcover copy. And if the case underneath the jacket is yellow, you know that you have a fourth printing of that book. All the other um, printings are either gray or blue. I forget, and my copy of Heir to the Empire is buried at the moment. The reason it's yellow is that the book reprinted so fast that the printer literally ran out of the other color case. They just didn't have any and they had to fulfill the reprint because the book was reprinting so quickly. And they were like, we have yellow, so we're just going to slap all these extra. We're just going to use yellow to bind the case. Um, so that one printing is in yellow, um, which makes the, this weird fun art. Okay. In, in a way that even without looking at your copyright page, you can know that your Heir to the, Heir to the Empire is a fourth printing. Um, Anyway, uh, I don't know. 
we're going to create some demand for that right now. I, I want one. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, like, I have no attachments to Heir to the Empire. I want to read it, but now I want the yellow case book immediately. Yeah. When I, um, whenever I, I, I'm at a show and like whenever I've been at a show that like Timothy Zahn was at and he and I have been like at a signing table together meeting readers, if someone brings up an Heir to the Empire, we always, when we open it, we always look to see. And if it's yellow, we show them on the jacket and we explain to them. We're like, did you know that, you know, know this thing about your book, um, uh, which is a fun, a fun thing to be able to point out. You were saying, do I get upset about the different colored cases? And then I was thinking about it. The higher public books do the same thing because Light of the Jedi is light if i recall it's in my star wars bookshelf in the other room but the other two are black so i really can't yes yes be grumpy have, about it yeah both rising <laughs> um rising storm and fallen star have much darker palettes on their jackets so they just lent themselves to using a darker darker case color things start to go bad um for our characters yeah, in yeah. The- yeah. <laughs> also you can't, you can't have the white case under no. things start to go bad right <laughs> um you know the titanic the fall of the star they begin anyway um but i also while you were talking about that it made me recall that i think brad and i theorized about what color like the case of the book would be for the the final alphabet squadron i might be lying but i don't think i am I think we were like what color is it gonna be what color the well i think we've at be? least theorized about the high republic logo itself because it was it was gold that that, and then it was blue and then it was black for phase three because i think we were thinking red because we always we always agree that the best star wars is red red (laughs) font red (laughs) marketing red everything but now it also has to be black because in like higher public yeah black's pretty sleek so it's fun these are these are all like fun very they they seem at times they may seem at times like one very easy and almost very um like throwaway decisions into like making a book, but they really aren't. And somebody has always spent like a, a ridiculous amount of time figuring out and deciding like, what color should this logo be? What color should the physical case underneath the jacket be? Um, and it, it's like, there's a million of those little decisions that go into every book that gets made. Um, and somebody has spent an inordinate but necessary amount of time trying to figure it out. Um, yeah. Shout out to the layout and design and people who, you know, put the books together in that sort of way because star wars books they always have a they're they look gorgeous on my star wars bookshelf Mm -hmm. all of them so i would be thrilled if i were losing sleep over my job if it was like what is going to be the color of the star wars book i mean that would be of of all the the problems that i think about my current job that seems like a huge a huge upgrade so i'm I'm, I'm a little envious of that of that uh... profession yeah, it's not a bad problem to have, you know, like what color, uh, what color should the background on this cover be? And then looking through like 40 different shades of blue and, you know, it's, it's almost like going to pick out paint swatches. You're like, all these are kind of the same, but, um, uh, yeah, that it's, that's, uh, it's not a bad, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, not a bad thing at all. Okay. So we've been talking about some fun things. We have a couple of fun hypotheticals if you would want to play. Um, Now that like all three books are out in the world, readers have enjoyed so many stories. Um, I'd love to know if there was a POV, if you could choose from any of the films that hasn't already been covered, if you were like, I'm going to write my dream story, or if you're like, I'm going to edit this character that hasn't been touched yet. Is there one in particular across all three books or one for each that you would love to have seen? I would definitely not be writing them because I'm not a writer uh, and I never, I do not aspire to be a writer. So I would definitely be editing them Um, for a new hope. I think Jet Porkins, the uh, pilot, mostly because like when we were writing down, taking our survey of that first film and just writing down like a who might get chosen so that we also then had a list that in case any authors was like, well, like, I don't really know what characters I could pick from. Do you, you know, do you have a list of folks? I had like written down Porkins and I was just like a thousand percent certain someone was going to pick him. Just a thousand percent certain. And, you know, someone's going to pick him and do a story and make some weird allusion to him being like related to the guy from Indiana Jones. And, you know, it's the same actor. Like, I just like assumed somebody was going to pick that character when they were picking pilots and he didn't get chosen. So probably Jet Porkins for, for A New Hope. Um, for Empire, um, uh, honestly, the person I would have chosen got chosen 
uh, in when John Jackson Miller was like, can I do what Ray Sloan is up to during the Empire Strikes Back? And I said, please, John, please write that story and send it to me. Um, so I probably would have chosen, but he, so he chose Ray Sloan. Um, man, it's kind of, and then Kevin Scott, the, the absolute brilliant, brilliant man that he is chose, uh, Jackson, the rabbit, who probably would have been another character that I would have chosen. Um, I think it's, I think I would have chosen just one of the, one of the Imperials on the Star Destroyer who looks up and is just like, what are all these bounty hunters doing here? And they have that reaction of just like, what the heck? I think there's a <laughs> funny, I think there's an interesting story there about like where this endless empire, this, we, we essentially have infinite power and resources and like, what are these absolute mad lads doing on the deck of the Star Destroyer? And Darth Vader is like giving them orders. Like, what are we doing here? What's going on? Uh, I think that, that there is a story there. Uh, Return of the Jedi. Um, we covered basically everybody at Jabba's Palace. You know, like, well, you know, not everybody, but mostly everybody. Um, this is really hard. I can't think of anyone. I think... I'm, I'm going to kind of do a cop out on this third one, but I think that I, it was really smart that Adam looked, uh, Adam Lance Garcia looked at the end of the film and is like, well, we've got these moments where we see these celebrations on all these other planets, which kind of gives you then, um, it gives you a runway to tell a story about so many different Star Wars characters who are not in the movie at all, because it's so natural that Dex is on Coruscant and we see Coruscant. So bam, there we go. You know, you see Naboo, we see a bunch of these places. And so I, I think I would have probably leveraged those moments to find probably another book character um, from a story to come and tell their perspective on seeing this big victory and seeing this really, you know, obviously not the actual end of the war, but, but, you know, um, the the absolute turning point and the sort of rounding towards the end of the war moment. Uh, I think I probably would have explored that space a bit more and looked around at characters um, in this era of the um, in this era of uh, of storytelling and try to find someone to to bring back in there. I think that um, that would have been my choice. Um, and I don't know which authors I don't know which authors I would have found to do all of that, but we would have found some. Um, yeah, I'm sure. Those are all great choices, honestly. Um, I will selfishly say I just I need to air this one out. Go for uh, it. For Return this of the is, Jedi. Yeah. Um, and I know Sarah and I would have wanted this is a uh Vanessa Doza story at the Battle oh, of nice. Endor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as a uh, as a pilot. That would have been amazing. We're so selfishly in the resistance camp <laughs> that we're like, we need more resistance rep in in the galaxy. Um well, that, yeah, so that, that would have been a space to explore it too, because whether it's someone who like Dex we've known in the past and we're now seeing them in the context of this film, or you do like what the other Adam, Adam Christopher did, which is you take a character from the sequel um, era in, in Pride, who we know in the future, and you show them their context here. So yeah, that, that's why I think those, those little tid scenes of seeing the rest of the galaxy just gives you that space to explore, you know, explore so much of that and to you know, clock a character who may not be important to us in terms of their storytelling for another, you know, few decades to see them right here and now at, at a moment. I think that that's really cool. Um, and why those two stories near the end are just like so cool as kind of a couple of the last stories you read, because it gives you a sense again of Star Wars existing back 30 years and existing for 30 years. And it's also one of those things that I think allows um, Star Wars fans to, you know, see the time that's passed or hasn't passed in a way that you can't necessarily do in the movies because you only have, you know, this actor who looks this way at this time to play this character at this age, um, at least, you know, without the assistance of other technologies that can do that. But um, yeah, to, to see a character like pride so much before we actually see him on screen um, allows, I think like all these, you know, it's, it's like the, the one meme that, um, I don't even know where it's from, where he's like putting all the strings together. It's what I feel like when I start reading these stories, <laughs> even though they're like canon adjacent, uh, I'm like, no, 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 it's all real. <laughs> so we, we did have a second hypothetical for you and this is, uh, this can be non-Star Wars related, but we wanted to know, is there any single piece of media 
that if you could make a fakpav out of, what would you choose? I mean, the, there's, there's anybody who knows me knows that there is only one answer to this question. And it's kind of funny because like in other forms, a fakpav for this kind of already exists. It's actually baked into it. But the answer is the Lord of the Rings. Right. And it just, that's the answer. Um, is just like, come on, you don't want 20 more stories about just hobbits being cool in the Shire and <laughs> planting their giant pumpkins and like just living, you know, charmed, wonderful, quiet, beautiful lives. And you don't want more stories about like the amazing Rohirrim and, you know, all the, you know, different Gondorian soldiers and, you know, stories about orcs it's just like there's so many characters and of course like if you read the appendices and all the other material tolkien ever wrote he kind of did fact bombs for everybody it's kind of already yeah, done totally. but yeah. like if we're really talking about like if we're just talking about like the if we were using the lord of the rings films only you know it's like fact of the lord of the rings films um i think come on come on this is yeah it's just right there um you know you can Peter Jackson is a cameo in all those films so you can have three fact pop stories about his characters you know um uh, you know, who doesn't want just like more Elrond stories about him being annoyed about his daughter and her terrible boyfriend, who's also <laughs> the king, you know, the one true king, like um, who doesn't want just um, just any number of stories from those films. And because when I watch those movies and I do it for Star Wars, but I do it for the Lord of the Rings films too, you know, I sit around watching those movies with people. And because we've all watched these movies now a billion times, I spend most of the time watching them, just pointing stuff out in the background. They're like, what's going on over there? And like making jokes about certain things and being like, that stormtroopers about there hit their head. And did you know Viggo Mortensen broke his foot? And like you bring all of the, you know, fact pov for Star Wars has been about celebrating all of that stuff and celebrating the experience of what do you, how do you experience a story that you already know so well? How do you, you know, by looking in the margins of it, but what's going on, what is the camera not pointing at that you are compelled to look at? And so doing that for anything else and the Lord of the Rings films, I think in particular, um, I think lend themselves to that. And I would just want to do that. Um, the other thing, which is like, this would be kind of slightly different. is just like a FACPOV story, a FACPOV series set in um dc comics that is just 40 stories about 40 different superheroes having to go get help from alfred pennyworth who is just the best character ever um you know whether it's somebody needs to go to like they want to learn how to make you know tea to impress someone you know and they go to him for help or they're like injured and he's stitching them up because batman's out doing whatever or it's one of the bat family who needs like some bit of counsel like just 40 stories about just alfred being wonderful um, you know, or someone who's like, I'm the sidekick, you know, caretaker to this superhero. How the heck do you deal with it? Because you're the caretaker to the superhero who asks for help the least. So if you can do it, you could probably, you know, help me figure this out. Like, um, so yeah, either Lord of the Rings or, or the Alfred Pennyworth fact pub series. Great answers. I, yeah. I feel like I'd be so fascinated, you know, to make it, a, to make it a trilogy of sorts, uh, or to make it a series to so see like the, um, like the the b and c villains day-to-day -day, um as an anthology um that would be really good yeah you get the alfred side and then you get like the i guess i gotta go fight batman today sort of yeah. like the the villains who like aren't full-time villain like their their full-time right. villainy doesn't pay all the bills so like <laughs> they have a day job and like three times a week they do villainy um you know they're I'm like thinking of like kite man yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, I got to work my shift at the store because that's how I pay my rent. And then like I try to do crime, but, you know, it doesn't pay all the bills. So in order to make rent or pay off my student loans, you know, I got to go, you know, work at the, you know, wherever they work. Yeah, right. Totally right. down for it. I'm down for that. I will uh, DC. Give me a call. I'll edit that in a, in a, in a heartbeat. <laughs> I will be the first copy. Uh, here I am. <laughs> From a certain point of villainy, it could still be fact pop. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, exactly. This is, this is going so well. Yeah, I think we got Love something it. here. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, this is how actual books get made. If anyone's oh, totally. wondering, like, it's li mostly people sitting around joking about something, and eventually you all stop joking. You're like, but wait a minute, we need to do that. Um, That's how podcasts get made too. But there's, yeah, you know, yeah. a Same little thing. bit more, a little bit more spontaneity in terms of uh, when we actually do the making of the thing. Probably. <laughs> maybe a question you can answer. Maybe a question you can't answer. Is there a last great thing that you've read that you would like to recommend to the people or maybe perhaps tell the people to anticipate in the far off future? 
Oh my gosh. Uh, yes, there is. Um, I just finished reading. Um, it is not a, a Star Wars book. It's also not a fiction book. Um, uh, which, you know, some folks will be like, well, there are other things. Yes, there are. Um, there is a book called How to Cook a Wolf. Um, it is by an author named uh, uh, M.F.K. Fisher. And this is a um, nonfiction. It's like a book of essays, um, primarily, you can think about. That was originally published in 1942. So at the height of, you know, um, World War II and rationing and, you know, um, folks on the home front having to go without and the, you know, lack of availability of, of all sorts of resources. And it is a book and a set of essays about um, this person um, who lived at the time writing essays about like essentially like how to cook for your family, how to feed your family, how to care for them. And it's about food and cooking in an era of, you know, um, in an era of scarcity. And it's called How to Cook a Wolf and it has recipes in it, but it also just has these amazing essays about what food means at a time like that. And, um, you know, what the idea of shopping for food and cooking and what those moments mean. Um, and it's like one of the more, I love reading about cooking and I love reading about books about food and the role that food plays in society or people's lives. And this book in particular is just, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal book. And the fact that it's written in the forties, like that, it doesn't matter. It's, you're going to read those essays and it's not going to feel like this person is writing from a different world entirely. Like they are, all the things that, that they are writing about are still so eminently relatable about the role that food can play in people's lives and the role that it can play in your life. If you are a person who, who does a lot of cooking and, and, you know, nourishes people. Um, it's incredible. It's fantastic. Um, it's also a very short, like kind of little book of essays. So, um, it's not a big, uh, read, which for me at the moment, I don't have a lot of free reading time. Cause I've got a bunch of actual, you know, manuscripts I have to work on. So it's probably the thing that I've read most recently that I've had time to, to step away from. Um, but I totally recommend it. Um, definitely check it out. Um, it's really great. It's had a bunch of republications so you can get nice little, um, uh, good looking copies. You don't have to go, um, searching for a used copy from 1942. Um, though it'd probably be really cool to get my hands on one of those. Um, so yeah, how to cook a wolf, which also just, you know, a plus plus title. You just, Oh, you can't, totally. Can't, can't do any better than that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I'll have to check that out. I, I just pulled it up on, uh, online. So it definitely looks interesting. Me too. Um, so thank you for sharing. Hopefully some of our listeners will check it out. Uh, and our last question here is what does star Wars mean to you? It's obviously had like a huge impact on your life, both as a, as a fan and now in your profession and, um, getting to, uh, just explore every aspect of it. Uh, what does it mean to you at the end of the day? If you had to sum it up. It means all the things that each one of its stories is always trying to um, evoke and be about. So it means hope. It means um, possibility. It means, uh, you know, uh, you are stronger because of the bonds that you share with other people and the bonds that you create with other people. You're not weaker for that. And that you're, you know, the only way forward is together. The only way, you know, the way forward is not alone. It means all of those things. But it also means everything to me as far as finding um, personal fulfillment and purpose in what I wanted to do as a career, which is to find people who are telling stories and help them make those stories. Because I'm not a writer. I'm not really a storyteller. I've never really felt that I had the capacity for that as much as I love stories. And I've never had the drive or, or feeling that I could actually create stories myself. And actually not even really the want to do that. But I really love aiding people in making stories. And so Star Wars means that to me because that is the place that I've found the ability to do that. Um, a lot of some folks know this, but folks who don't know this about me is that before I was an editor, I was a tax accountant. I worked in um, I worked for I worked uh, in public accounting. I worked with hedge funds, all sorts of crazy financial stuff. If you ever watched the big short or any of those ridiculous things like I worked in that world. And one day when I decided I didn't want to do that anymore, and when I decided that I wanted to go work in the publishing and I wanted to become an editor, and I didn't know how I was going to do that, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. I walked into my boss's office 
once I kind of had a plan in place, which was, oh, I'll go back to school because that'll help me figure it out. And once I had that in place, I walked into my boss's office and I sat down and I gave my two weeks notice. And my boss said to me, what are you doing? You have a really good job. Um, the economy is very bad. Um, this was, by the way, like 2008, 2009, not like last year. <laughs> They're like, what are you doing? Um, and I said what I was going to do. And they said, well, what are you going to go do with this? You can go into publishing. What are you going to go do? And I sat in her office and this is going to sound hypocritical. I swear it's true. Uh, I don't need to make it up because it's true. I said, I'm going to go work at Del Rey and I'm going to make Star Wars books. That's what I said to her um, in 2000. And uh, uh, well, I guess it was actually not 2000. It was 2010, but you know, still bad economy. That's what I said to her sitting in that office. And she said, uh, okay, good luck. And you know, that was that. She's actually very supportive. But I said that then, and that was two years before I got an internship at, at Del Rey, now Random House Worlds. And that had, was four years before I started working there. And so even though Star Wars is not the only thing that I work on, it you know, means as much to me as anything. And it has given me the opportunity to be a custodian of this thing that so many people love and a custodian of being able to help shape stories in it for um, authors and for creators and, you know, hopefully help more people find those things like hope and joy and connecting with other people. And so being able to facilitate that even 0.0001% over any of the books that I've ever had a hand on working on, like that's what it means to me. And that's why I like adore doing it and can't imagine not doing it. And someday I won't do it because nobody does it forever. And I'm only a custodian of it, but I, um, I just absolutely cherish it. It means everything. Um, it really does. Um, uh, it really, really does. Um, so yeah, that's why. That's what you might you might end up doing it forever at the at the rate that people are asking for <laughs> if, fat uh, Yeah, a couple the, of of uh, secrets yeah. of the Sith might get you there. Yeah, if the the yeah. um, <laughs> if the the reading community is to be believed, and I I, I I cannot tell you how flattering it is. People are like, when you're still here in 2064, I'll be here with a story, and I'm like, man. I appreciate that <laughs> so much, <laughs> but also I kind of hope not uh, right. for many reasons. One, you know, ideally I get to enjoy a retirement at some point. And two, you know, like so many things, um, I only, I'm the custodian of this thing for now. And when I get the tap on the shoulder, someone else gets to be the custodian of it. And that means that they will make it better than I ever could and so on and so forth. You know, um, you know, they, 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 uh, we are what they grow beyond kind of thing. It's just that. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, maybe I will, maybe I will be here. In 2016. You know, uh, <laughs> whether or not if, that's the case, there probably will be star Wars books to continue looking I would, forward to. I would imagine. So um, if there is, so. if there is one in 2064 and I'm editing it, we are coming back to do another episode about it. I'm <laughs> pulling you two uh, into duty for that. So right, like, putting it on the calendar now. Uh, yeah. I think we've joked a couple of times. It's like, hey, if we're like 80 years old or something and we got to we got to bust one more episode out for like maybe our two listeners that are still around. Uh, we're doing it. We're, we're going to do it. The hundred year celebration of, of a of a new hope. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> nobody gets to leave Star Wars. Everybody is in it. <laughs> We're all in this together all the way. Brad, Brad keeps going, well, you got to at least do the podcast until this time. We can't, yeah. we can't, qu not that we're planning to, but you can't quit this thing until we at least get to this milestone at every turn. So it's, yes. that, <laughs> at this point, we'll be so podcasting well. forever. Um, seriously, thank you so much for, you know, the work that you do uh, at, at Star Wars and with Random House Worlds uh, in Star Wars and beyond. As readers, I know that we're super, super grateful um, and have enjoyed so many stories. Um that you have helped to bring to life and um thank you for your time and hanging out with us for like an hour plus thanks so much sorry we didn't mean to go that long <laughs> oh no this was a pleasure i I'm, I'm so grateful that you you invited me on the show i love listening to the show love all the interviews all the deep dives you you both do so to be asked to come on the show is a real real privilege um so thank you um and you know always always love being able to come chat about books and uh Star Wars books are just books in general. Talk about bookcase co colors and, and trim size and stuff like I love that stuff. So Anytime. Um, I appreciate, I appreciate <laughs> you giving me an avenue for all of that. And I'll, Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's glad I'm glad to know at least one person is listening to those unhinged deep dives that we do. So thank you. It's uh, you're enabling us now um, for some more egg talk. 
at our like but. two two fifteen when it gets a really yeah. a little wild. You don't want to be here in forty minutes, trust me. Uh, with that being said, Tom, thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, where can our listeners find you online? And um, I guess like from your point of view, uh, what can they look forward to coming up from from Del Rey? Sure. Uh, so online, you can find me um, on the place formerly known as Twitter, uh, as Darth Internus, I-N-T-E-R-N-O-U-S. Um, also, even though I don't run the Delray Star Wars social medias anymore, I am still technically involved with that. So theoretically, you could find me through that. Uh, I'm also on Blue Sky at Darth Internus as well. Um, I just started a Substack newsletter called The Cubicle at the End of the Galaxy. Um, if you go to my socials, you can find links to that, which is now going to be my outlet for telling deep dive ridiculous stories into like why is publishing the way it is and things like bookcases and trim sizes and all sorts of other weird things. So um, uh, those are the places that you can find me. Um, as far as what's coming next from uh, the Delray and Random House world's folk, um, you know, we've got New York Comic Con coming up in October. So if anyone is going to New York, um, you can come see us. We will have a booth there. We will have things there that we are still finalizing figuring out but i promise we will it'll be a great time you can come hang out at the booth and you do not have to apologize for hanging out um you can keep me in the team company um and then you know we're we're rolling into the fall with um more high republic with phase three um our first novel um george mann's eye of darkness um which is going to be really phenomenal george has done really incredible work he's worked really hard on and he's put in like so much effort into creating this amazing story. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, and then uh, the wonderful thing about Star Wars is there's there's always more coming. Um, and it's going to be fun and it's going to be exciting. And uh, I'm super excited about it. And so everyone else should be too. Uh, so, yeah. I live in fear, but like an excited fear. <laughs> Totally. Uh, what, what do the Jedi fear? What do we fear? It's more books that books. we have to read, discuss, <laughs> dissect. And it's, it's not that much. we have to read them. It's we're excited about it. And, yeah. you know, like the, the journeys we're going to go through. But like, wow, I'm emotions. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, Tom. Uh, we look forward to the fall and uh, for more for more books from yourself and the team. So thank you. Uh, and until then, may the force be with you. <laughs> Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to our conversation with Tom Holler. And as a reminder, you can find us on all of our socials, including Twitter, Instagram and YouTube, as well as Sarah and I on Letterboxd and Goodreads. If you'd be so kind and you enjoyed the episode, make sure to leave us a written review. Helps other folks find the show and consider following the podcast to get all of our future episodes, especially those about the High Republic Initiative uh, with Phase 3 launching in the fall. We also have a Patreon starting at just $1 a month. It's an extra way to support the show. Thank you to all of our patrons who make this show happen. It truly means the world to us. That is all for this episode. Thank you all again for listening. And until next time, may the force be with you always.